You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family. Today, first of all, I must apologize. My voice sounds like I have been smoking for 40 years, but I was at a Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within conference this past weekend in Palm Beach, Florida. And if you've ever been to anything Tony Robbins that is high energy, there's a lot of loud talking and dancing and screaming and things of that sort, just getting high energy. So good Lord, I can't talk. Sorry about that. But we're going to welcome back to the show today, Mr. Reed Goosens, who is the operator and owner of RSM Capital. He is a multifamily operator, been doing this for a very long time, back in 2014 timeframe. And if you want to go hear his first episode on Real Estate Runway, go back to episode 58, Building a Robust Business Through Branding with Reed Goosens. It was a fantastic episode talking about how you built the business with the right people and the right branding and the right awareness. Today, we're going to bring him back on and we're going to talk a little bit about where we are, where we're going, what we're feeling in, in each other's business, you know, things of that sort. And just what does this economic winter mean and when is spring coming? Okay. So without further ado, let's welcome back to the show, Mr. Reed Goosens. And oh, by the way, listeners, if you get any value out of this show, please, please, please scroll down, leave us a five-star review and a thoughtful comment. Those ratings and comments are worth their weight in gold and are the only way to increase the reach of the show. You can also follow us via our parent company, Quattro Capital on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Team Quattro Capital, one word, no special characters, or by simply visiting us at thequattroway.com. We really appreciate all of you, and we would love to hear back from you. If you have any content requests, feedback, or just want to say hello, drop us a note at podcast at thequattroway.com. We'd love to hear from you. And also, if you'd like to apply to be on the show, go to thequattroway.com slash podcast. And now, on to your scheduled production. All right. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton. We are powered by Quattro Capital here in this episode. And I'm joined again today from one of the original gangsters of the Real Estate Runway back in the day, Reed Goosens, episode 58. If you haven't listened to it, go catch his bio and what he is up to. The episode title is Building a Robust Business Through Branding with Reed Goosens. That was a fantastic episode about really the importance of marketing and your image and what's going on with with your business in general. So, Reed, welcome back to the show. How have you been since, what was it, June we recorded last? Good to see you, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me back. It's been been really good. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot's happened, right? So, we, we've probably got a lot to talk about in, in, in the real estate market and every, on everyone's mind, what's happening and where we're going and how do we navigate these choppy waters? You know, a lot has happened since back then. And actually, Reed and I recorded on his show just a few days, weeks ago, I think. Maybe it was last week or the week before. So, I feel like we're having a little bit of deja vu here and good to see him on the show again. But Reed, we already know your background. You know, you were the, you were running with RSN Property Group, you know, basically operating lots of multifamily properties across the nation. But what have you been up to personally and professionally since we did the last episode? Just catch us up on what's been going on in Reed's life. Yeah, look, pretty quickly, like the biggest news is had a little, like my first child, a little baby girl. It's been, she's six weeks old today. So we're recording here November 8th. I don't know when this is going to go live, but being a real, as an entrepreneur, been a real handbrake. <laughs> you know, you want to be productive all the time. And, and at 36, you know, I've been, I've been grinding for over a decade now and it's just a completely different perspective. And, you know, until you go through it, it's, it's very interesting, you know, so trying to have, keep the business going and, but also taking some time off to spend time with her and, and and my wife. It's it's just trying to find that balance. But then also trying to grow the business as well in, in this sort of you know, difficult time right now. It's a bit of a standstill in multifamily with, I'm sure we'll get into it in terms of you know where we are on the market and where we're heading, but still trying to submit offers, still trying to make deals pencil and then just hanging around the hoop and trying to get a rebound here. So yeah. And, and, and then really also work focusing on the team, making sure I'm hiring the right people. I've brought on three new people to RSM Property Group. And we're actually preparing for our first inaugural uh, meetup because we are all virtual across the country. So we're all flying in here in December and we're going to have a, a great weekend down in Venice. And you know, it, it's important to me to build a good culture in the, in the company. So I'm really focusing on that here, you know, between looking at deals, operations and, you know, the end of year, I'm, I'm really, really focusing on sort of those couple of handful of items. 
Yeah, you know, and, and I think as entrepreneurs, we really can't do nothing, right? While while deal flow, and really what it is, we'll get into this, is the bid ask has changed so much between buyers and sellers. You know, what what are we to do? Let's let's improve the business, you know, maybe have a kid and read his case and, <laughs> and just enjoy life a little bit. So, and by the way, if if you're sensing any lower level of energy in Reed's voice than he usually appears on an episode, it's probably because he hasn't slept in exactly six weeks if his daughter is six <laughs> weeks old. So welcome, welcome back to the show, Reed. So yeah, man, let's get into, uh, I mean, you really brought a good point just a second ago is as entrepreneurs, as high achievers, we want to be productive all the time. There's always something to be done and we kind of measure sometimes our self-worth and what we've accomplished, you know? Maybe let's let's chat a little bit about what new balance you've had to find in your life. Just, you know, talking a little bit of personal professional and how you're managing the business that you that you own and operate along with your beautiful new baby girl and, and you know, balancing that time. Yeah, I was actually just on Kevin Bupp's podcast talking to him about, given that I am Australian and the, the different mindset that sometimes Americans have versus the rest of the world in, t- in terms of taking holiday. You know, he was talking about, you know, he tried to take a week off and, you know, nearly pulled, pulled his hair out. And I was like, well, that's probably more an American problem than, than, than a you problem than anything else. But, you know, one of the things that, yeah, my wife really wanted me to do, and she's American, is like, Take a couple of weeks maternity leave. You, know, you you run the business, you own the business. You should be able to do this. This is precious times, and you won't get them back, right? And 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 I, I do have an ethos that I believe in that. And uh, unfortunately, I did get sucked back into the business because it is hard to when you're building and you have new employees. You can't just like, all right, here the here the keys. You know, don't don't crash dad's car. But it, it also tries to put in perspective what is really important in the business. And I'm only seeing things that are boiling to the top and putting restrictions in place. You know, when I did have those two and a half, three weeks off, I was like, look, I'm going to be available for an hour every other day at this time. This is when you can contact me. Outside that, don't, don't, don't call me, right? Don't, don't even try and come near me. So having that balance has been really key, but it's also learning that balance. You don't just, that just doesn't just happen, right? As a, you know, as a been building this, 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 this business and this company for over a decade now, you're, you're just so ingrained in you to always want to hustle and work and 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 taking that time to think, look, there's a good, precious little infant that is helpless, and you know, everything else sort of melts away. And it's you know very cliche to say that because I have had so many people say that to me over the years. But until you go through it, but then also you know be reinvigorated on focusing on you know family, business, health, and they're sort of the real the real three pillars in my life now. That you know as this new chapter compared to say before it was just sort of business and, and personal life, and that was it. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I love that you have that ethos, right? And, and you're right. Many of us, I'll say born and bred Americans, we're, we're raised with that problem of, you know, you work to live rather than live to work. Or, sorry, you live to work rather than work to live and get that backwards. And so, you know, I, I love what you're doing. It's, I'm glad you're spending time with your, with your little girl. And, you know, I think a little hidden gem that you dropped in there for all of you entrepreneurs out there, all of you high achievers, you know, if, if you are the business, I mean, the, the difference is, are you an owner? Or are you an operator? And I, I just came fresh out of a Tony Robbins conference where I got that beat into my head. So it's right. It's just really fresh here. But if you have had the, the foresight to start to replace yourself in the business so you can work on the business and you started putting good people in place, you should not be afraid to test that and take some time off. And if you can't take that time off, hey, ask yourself, is it a limiting belief? You know, can you really do it? Or. On the, on the other hand, have you hired enough people? Have you put systems, processes, and people in place to replace you out of the business? Because truth be told, if any one of us ever gets hit by a bus and the business falls apart, then it's not a very good business. So <laughs> I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But what, what, you know, 100%. On and, and like what, one of the things I got involved in the business coming out of a W-2 was around control of my time. Now, one of the things, and, and, and we're all geared as entrepreneurs to you know, be, be, be comfortable with uncertainty. Right? A lot of people don't become entrepreneurs because they like the certainty of a paycheck or they like the certainty of having their weekends off. And, and being an entrepreneur, it's, it, you go from nine to five to 24, seven, 365 days a year, and it becomes part of your DNA, right? And so to then wean yourself off that you know, with the birth of a child or a death of a family member or a life-changing moment it's, it, it smacks you in the face because you're just being head down, bums up for so long. And it just really p- sort of makes you realize what is your priorities versus goals. And are you, to your point, creating a business or are you creating just yourself another job? And what I've learned in the last 12 months, sort of ramping up RSN, sort of Reed Goosens 2.0, is, is hiring the right people in the right positions. 
you know, it's not perfect today and it's going to look different in 12 months' time or in 10 years' time, but it's that starting by letting go of the vine. And there's a book in my shelf here, Who Not How, just behind me, and also Traction. And it, it, it talks about letting go of the vine as a sole entrepreneur. You, you, you built it because you had no money and you, you don't know how to let go of things, right? And as you start you know, getting some success and start, you know, the business starts making money, you can start, do you decide to you know, hoard those well, the acorns like a, like a chipmunk away or do you go and reinvest in good talent and in the business? And, and, and I've chosen to do that this year and it's, I think it's, I'm laying a great foundation for a successful company that's going to be around you know, beyond my lifetime, hopefully. That is absolutely the best analogy. I love who, not how Dan Sullivan, it's been mentioned on the show at least 1,328 times. <laughs> so I really, really love that book and couldn't, you, you, you even just stumbled. First of all, editors, please make sure you catch the quote that just came, that just came out, heads down, bums up. That's a new one. We're going to make sure that goes into the quotable lines of the, the show. It's fantastic. But going back into the, the analogy you just made, Reed, I mean, you mentioned you know, are you going to be a squirrel holding all your acorns or are you going to give some of those away? Well, I'd venture the analogy is, are you going to hire some more squirrels to go pick? I mean, even if they pick the acorns, only 80% as good as you, but you hire 10 squirrels, that's 800% more than you mm-hmm. can do, even if you're running at 150%. So, you know, right. to, to, to Reed's point, at some point you have to invest back in the business. You have to invest in your time freedom. Otherwise, you will always be in the business and you are an operator, not an owner. Thank you for that wisdom, Reed. It, it, it's on point for everyone right now, I think. So use this time. If you are a, an owner of real estate and you acquire real estate as your primary modality, use this time because I tell you what's coming and we're going to get into this right now. What is coming is a buying frenzy. And if you do not have the staff, if you do not have the capital ready to go, you're going to miss out on this wonderful recession that we get to capitalize. And yes, I did just use the word wonderful and recession in the same sentence. So Reed, let's, and I got to give my voice a little bit of a break here. Reed, let's get into what you see going on in your world today. You mentioned that the the multifamily market is down a little bit. Things are slower. Let's talk about why that is. And we just did a great interview on your show with this. So maybe we, we can even take the, the same direction with it. You know, yep. what do you see from your perspective happening today that's driving you know today's environment. How do we get here? Yeah, well, let's talk about how do we get here, right? So, beginning of the year, you know, we, we came out of COVID. A lot of money was printed. I'm not going to talk. It's not a political commentary on on this show. It's just you know, we, as as investors, we just need to react. We we have no control over the market, and I'll say that first and foremost. We have zero control as much as we like to think we do. We don't, and the market will be the market, right? So you just have to react in real time and make the best decisions in real time. So we're coming from a lot of QE happened for good or bad. It's now causing a lot of inflationary environments, a lot of pressure on people's pockets. You know, the gas, you and I are paying the same at a gas pump. People's, you know, cost of living's going up, groceries are going up. And I'll say this is happening across the globe. This is not just happening here in the US, it's happening in Australia, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in Europe. And we you know, the globe is is reeling after a lot of money being printed. Some countries are doing better than others. America's actually doing quite a lot better than than other countries. And and so it's all about perspective. But we're having you know, the low. What, what is common is that every single central bank, including obviously the Fed as well, is trying to control inflation, and they're doing that by rising raising interest rates. Right. So we have seen the Fed rate go from zero point two five percent to over four and a half percent, or predicted to be over four and a half percent by year's end. That's quadrupling in less than twelve months. I think you know, and I don't have the right stats, but it's one of the quickest accelerations in interest rate ramping up in history but you look back at this you know you look back at the 70s people are talking about the the absolute rate and went from 10% to, or 11% to 22% but we we're, we're starting at zero and going to four so it's quadrupling so that rate of change is really having a massive impact and it's having a massive impact on the multifamily space but it's having a massive impact across a lot of things and so it's the fed is doing it's doing the job of what what it wanted to do which was slow down the economy a little bit and, and slow down the, the inflation. And so what I'm seeing today is that we have, if you bought a deal and I bought deals in the beginning of the year that you're probably having paying interest rate on a floating rate debt of somewhere between, I don't know, four to four and a half percent. I'm now paying that same debt is over six and a half, maybe seven percent, depending on the spreads. And yet you've still got investors or sellers wanting to sell at four cap rates, right? Or sub four cap rates. And so there's now bigger arbitrage between what sellers want to sell for and what you can get debt at. And that's causing, you know, just a standstill, right? I'm seeing a lot of quote unquote deals coming to market, but they're 
really price discovery. They're, they're, they're sellers saying, what can I sell this asset for? Who's going to pay me something for right now? I'm getting calls from brokers for the first time in forever, <laughs> you know, chasing me to, ch- to do deals. And so there is just, it's hard to get a deal done in this environment when you have sellers still expecting four caps when interest rates are above six, just the, that arbitrage doesn't work. So historically, and I'm sure you're the same, Chad, is that we can handle some arbitrage. You, know, might, you might buy a, a four cap and get interest rates at maximum five, so there's a 100 basis point spread. But if you believe in your value add you know, plan, you can write that ship and get it to cash flow because yeah. and, and knowing that the Fed isn't going to increase your interest rates quadruple <laughs> in 12 months, you, you feel pretty confident and that's historically where we've been at. Today, we've got, we've got rates rising quicker than what business plans can be implemented at, right? So, so my, myself included, I've hit my rate caps on all my floating rate debt. And I tell you, I haven't renovated as quickly as those rates caps have, have been hit. So there's going to cause a cash flow problem, right? Which is then going to cause, okay, maybe in distributions have got to stop, right? And so what I'm doing today is one, making sure we've got enough cash on hand. Two, communicating that to investors and why we may may or may not be pausing missions depending on where you are in your deal, your value add deal. And three, I'm continuing to hang around the hoop in all my markets because I know that thing pain is going to come. I know people are going to have to either come out or you've got to refi, the, 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 the rate cap is coming due and they can't refi in a 6.5% interest rate environment when they bought it at 4% four interest rate. So there's going to be a buying power here coming up very, very soon. Right now, which is kind of figuring out the rules of the game, right? We're all investors first and foremost. We can make money in any market. We just don't know what the rules are right now. We don't know where we're headed. Coupled with the fact that it's coming up to a historically slow season anyway, Thanksgiving's around the corner, Christmas is around the corner. Usually deals slow up anyway in this time. And I, But I do think come you know, Q1 next year, NMHC, if anyone goes to NMHC, I think is in Vegas next year, you'll see, I think, a big uptick in you know in where rates so deals hitting the market and also you know I forgot to mention that you've got the midterm elections going on right now which is also you know, causes historically slow market movements in, in and around the commercial real estate space. Yeah, so we have a lot going on right now, listeners. As you can tell, I mean that's that's kind of how we got here. And and by the way, just to segue from the driving force that we cannot control, you know, we are before we go back into this and talk about what's to come. Let's decouple the capital markets and the, and the economy a little bit from the rental real estate fundamentals themselves, right? And so I think what Reed is alluding to, and I want to, we're going to come right back and smash that ball here in a minute, is the things that are going to be trading while interest rates are this high are probably going to trade at a discount because they have to trade right now. It's going to be someone who either has bled out because they don't have enough money in the account to overcome their now doubled or tripled interest rate, or it's going to be someone who has to refinance right now. They're out of time and they simply cannot refinance you know, into a loan and keep the property. They have to sell it. So before we get into all that kind of stuff, right, those opportunities, are you seeing any deviation to the fundamentals of how your properties are operating, any rental decreases or anything of that sort? So I'll say that high level, 30,000 foot level, increased interest rates ha- are having a pain on not only just borrowers, but also on the single family housing market. It's also having a pain on new construction. Lump, look at lumber prices. It's actually, they're, they're down right right now. Housing starts are, are being pulled, projects are being shelved because no one can swallow the fact that you know a construction loan may cost you 10% these days. <laughs> so the deal just doesn't pencil. So what that means, but there's still a need and a supply there uh, issue. That we need to, sorry, this we need to, thank you. We need to overcome. And so there's still going to be demand there for, for, for rentals, right? That's macro level. And I, I still fundamentally believe in, you know, affordable housing in and around a $40,000 to $60,000 household income are still going to need a roof over your head. And that fundamental is still not going to, is, is unchanged. What I am seeing is with inflation today, snapshot, depending on what market you're in, Starting to see a little bit of a ceiling develop with your the, what you can charge on renovated product, and that is because people can own, if wages aren't going up, there's only so much you can pay for rent. So I've got a deal in in Phoenix, Arizona right now. Some of my lease trade outs has been over seven hundred dollars, which is insane. Great, great to come in if we could snap the fingers and do it across all one hundred and thirty five units. But I now know that I to get to that goal. 
to get everyone up to that number, it may take a little bit of a different path than what I originally thought because you can't just go turn that knob and everyone's now paying $600 on a trade out. You may have to do it incrementally. And that is probably where the operation side comes into it is more valuable now and making decisions in real time as we're seeing that data coming back saying, hey, a renewal, people can't renew at this rate anymore. They maybe probably could 12 months ago, but because their credit card statements are up and their, you know, the cost of groceries are going up, the cost of petrol, that's going to have a squeeze on that extra $150 you know, bump on their rent for a newly renovated product. All right, well, maybe we don't do the newly renovated product. Maybe do a partial and charge them 50 bucks more. So there's just different things I'm seeing in real time that we're having to make decisions on that are affecting how we get to our end goal to increase the NOI. So then it coupled that with what I said before. Well, now you're not getting your massive rental premiums that you thought you were going to get straight out of the gate and you've got rising debt interest rates. There's there's a bit of a soup going on here that you need to just, as good oper- as a good operator, you need to be able to navigate and then communicate to your investors about how you're going to go about doing that. So said a lot of things there, but that is sort of how I'm seeing re- stuff roll, play out in real time. Yeah, that's, that's perfect, Reed. And, and- Everyone, this is kind of going into what he was saying earlier about, you know, the arbitrage between what you're paying for a property and what you're effectively paying in interest, right? The, the cap rate and the interest rate. And, you know, as, as good value add operators, we've had a good, you know, good finger on the pulse of what can we charge for a value add renovated unit in whatever market, sub market and asset quality type that you're in. And so what he's saying is th- there is some possibility that maybe Maybe rents do stagnate or maybe you can't quite snap to that new income line as quick as you can because people are feeling, you know, anyone who uses debt in the country, people who manufacture things, goods, services, food, whatever, their debt is also up, by the way. It's not just real estate debt. It's all debt, you know, and further other countries. I mean, think about the global impact of this. Go look at the Goldman Sachs report that Pensford just put out. The global impact of this is what are we? We are the reserve currency of the world, at least for now. Right. And so what's going on is if we are raising interest rates, what do other countries usually borrow in? Well, probably US dollars because nobody else trusts their currency. So they've also got to raise interest rates to keep up with us. So everyone around the globe is feeling this, which means supply chain is feeling this, goods and services, and it goes right back to the pocketbook. So what am I saying in all that? Effectively, the fundamentals are probably still there over the long term, right? Maybe over the near term, you have to be a little less aggressive with how you go from line A to line B of, of rent growth. But to Reed's, bringing it all back to Reed's point is, you know, if you think about the water level, maybe the, the surface level, if you have to buy a property at, a let's say, a, five, a 5% five interest rate, but then a 4% cap rate like we were before maybe, you know, you might be underwater until you get that cap rate equal to effectively your purchase cap rate equal to the the interest rate you're paying and then your positive leverage from there. Well, now, if people are still trying to sell things at four caps and we're at, you know, six, seven, eight percent, depending what you're what kind of debt you're doing, you're way further underwater. Now, the your ability to climb to the surface is still the same. But can you hold your breath that long? That's the analogy, right? Do you have enough money in the tank and, and ability to swim back to the surface and be positive. That's that's the added risks. So that's why you have to be careful buying. So love anyway, love, wonderful love, points, love, Reed. I love, appreciate love, that. Love that. Love that analogy. Yeah, I just thought of it here. So maybe we'll have to quote it. I don't know. It was, it's a good one. But analogies make it, it helps us make sense of the world we're in because really that's why everyone speaks in parables and analogies. So all right, let's let's bring it back to kind of where we are and where we're going. So in your opinion, knowing that real estate is local and, and hyper local the opportunities that you see yourself looking to acquire in the next, let's say, 12 to 36 months, what do you think that avatar is? Like, What kind of deals are these? What problems do they have? Or is it, is, are things just going to snap back to normal, in your opinion? Let's, let's, let's see what Reed's crystal yeah. ball looks like. Look, I, I hate using the word crystal ball because no one has one, right? I think you know if you look at all the data, look back at history and try and throw a dart against the board and see where it lands, I think we're going to have your know, inflationary environment a high inflationary environment, I should say, for for an extended period of time. I don't think we're coming back to zero interest rates tomorrow. Do I think in two years' time that the debt market will look different to what it is today? A hundred percent. So, you know, I'm also being cautious of the debt I'm trying to get today. That I'm not locking myself in and 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 avoiding a refi or getting into a cheaper rate for tomorrow, right? And and so 
having that flexibility is really important. I think in terms of sticking to your numbers and sticking to your underwriting, I am seeing adjustments in cap rates already in real time happening. It just the naturally cap rates will follow interest rates. So you will start seeing a better cap rate, so to speak. But if your borrowing costs are going up, then you're not really cash flowing anyway. So I think you're going to see a pinch on the cash flow on new deals coming forward. So I think there's going to be a slightly reduced expectations. But if you're looking to place money for the long term, you know, five to seven years, you're going to do just fine. And it's just still around the fundamentals of making sure you're adding value to an asset. Where are rents today in in place? Where can you get them to? And then maybe you know, 12 months ago, you might be like, oh yeah, they're going to have double digit rent growth in Austin or Phoenix or Dallas or Charlotte. Well, maybe it's just going to be zero rent growth, right? And maybe instead of the $1,500, I could only get $1,350, but I'm still, my, my existing rents are at $800. bucks. Well, it's still a good lease trade out. It just may not be the ceiling. So I think there's just going to be an easing off of that because there's only so much blue collar people who we rent to can pay for it. And that's and that's just the reality of, of what we talked about before in, in terms of hitting the pocketbook. There will be buying opportunities. I, I just think you just got to stick around the hoop and know when to buy and, and stick to your numbers and make sure you're not you know stretching. Where I think 12 months ago, a lot of people were stretching to get a deal done because they wanted to keep transactional. 100, you know, hard money is probably one that's gone completely out the window these days. You know, 12 months ago, I was offering over seven figures of hard money on some deals, right? To get to win in competitive markets. Today, zero. I get a free look and I can back out of a deal if I can't get the debt. That is a complete 180. And I don't see that coming back anytime soon, which is a good thing for us as buyers because we get a bit of time to, you know, figure out the debt scenario. So again, I've said a lot of things in there. I do think the Fed will have to reduce interest rates because they cannot keep high high relative to where we come from. Because I, I read a stat the other day that if it goes from six to eight or something, that two percent arbitrage, it's going to be more spending on the U.S. national debt than all the defense budget or something silly like that. So th- they'll be forced into doing it, coupled with the comment you made earlier about the pain that you're seeing in other developing countries who borrow the U.S. dollar and now got to pay back. You know, the U.S. dollar is at ex- all-time highs right now. Well, all these countries can't just afford to pay it back, but then that has a knock-on effect of well. Are they getting defaulting on that loan? So you know, you, you, you get you're seeing this sort of you know, global recession. I don't I don't know where we're going, but I know that I'm just trying to keep to the fundamentals of what I do know and what I can control, and that is just be prudent with my with my debt, be prudent with my underwriting, make sure my operations are intact, and you know, try and keep an eye that that this will pass and this will you know will will, will come into some smoother waters here in the next twelve to eighteen months. Well, yeah, that's that's perfect, Reed, and and absolutely correct. And you know, folks. I guess the thing to remember is the Fed is trying before anything else to squash inflation, right? And the reason that is, is the dollar is about 96% depreciated. No currency has ever survived 97. So they're trying like hell to stop it. That's priority number one. They know they're strangling the economy. They know they're causing a lot of changes in many industries. And I think the interesting thing is, in all cases, this will pass. This is a short-term thing. The question is, is it, you know, is it going to happen in the shape of a V? Is it going to go up to a point and they go so far that they have to all of a sudden snap it the other way and maybe even start pumping more money into the economy to bring it back to life? In which case we may be having the same conversation in three to four years when they have to, to, you know, quantitatively tighten again. Or God willing, they're going to figure this out. They're going to get it to where the CPI, the, the consumer price index starts to come down. And then after those indications, which I think we really might see, by the way, towards the end of this year, because what what is nobody doing? The labor market has not loosened, but hiring decisions for 2023 are being made right now. This is Those are Q4 decisions in most cases. So it's going to be curious if you think you're going into a recession, you know, some of us will be hiring, but, you know, others, especially large corporations may tighten the belt a little bit. They may say, let's just hold off. So anyway, I digress. Back to it. If we do level off and CPI levels off, we will see a, a gradual decrease and probably a new normal. And then maybe we'll just, everything will regulate and we'll be good to go. So very interesting. Reed, thank you for coming on and sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate Pleasure. the discussion and just hearing how other people in the industry are, are talking about this stuff. But before we let you go, I've got four questions, the quattro four we've got to ask you here for get to know you a little bit better before we let you go. How's that sound? Let's do it. All right. Question number one, what is your superpower? 
in your business? I think I, I think I might have said this last time on the show, which I'm sorry to repeat myself. It's probably perspective. Being in, being someone f- not from this country, perspective is a really important thing. We don't have multifamily in Australia. Like the US, it's got a little bit in Canada in terms of the Western Hemisphere. The US has the best yield on commercial real estate, full stop. And that's because the lending market here is just unlike anything else. You don't see multifamily in Europe. You don't see it in Australia. I'm talking about garden style. So it's very, very unique asset class to the US. And, and, you know, as an, as an Aussie seeing, you know, coming from probably eight to 10 percentage IRRs, you know, to seeing even a 13 to 15 percent IRR is, you know, in five years is, is freaking awesome. So I think perspective is probably a big one. And, and I've always got to keep. You know, I keep a good tab on what's happening in the Australian market, and that that helps me make better decisions for what we do here moving forward here at RSN in the U.S. market. You know that that is a valuable piece of perspective that you just gave to us, actually. So thank you for that. All right, so we've we've heard a lot of really qualifying information from you. We know you've been doing great things, but give me and you, it's okay to cheat off yourself from before, but if you want to give a new answer, you can. Give me what's your biggest or second biggest mistake in in life or business, and what did you learn from? Hmm. He's trying to top his last one, ladies and gentlemen. We'll let him think. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I I think it's a mistake. I think it's the evolution of being an entrepreneur. There's been some personal things that have happened in my 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 career: loss of family members, loss of business partners. Not necessarily a a, a physical loss, but we've separated, which has caused me to really align with what I want to build. Right? Like in the beginning, you know, you build something as a partnership and. It might be sort of shared vision, right? But you get to a point where you build something and say, "Hey, no, I can stand on my own two feet," or I, you know, I value the time with the family, or whatever that might be. And we, you know, you separate parts. So, I think standing—not necessarily is a mistake, but it's a it's a learning lesson. Standing in my true value sooner is probably one of the biggest lessons I've learned. Like, I do have value and I do have worth, and I should go. And it's a little bit not pretentious, but you know, self indulgent to say that I want to create a company in my vision and that's okay. And standing in that own, you know, that own self-worth to say I'm worth that has probably been a recent, a recent lesson that I've learned a little bit more. And it's, it, it's how I want to build my company and it's, it is my company, right? So, and, and, and I'm worth it. Absolutely. That perspective, that, that is a second piece of perspective. So thank you for sharing that and, and knowing that you can go after the vision you're looking for. All right. And question number three, you know, we, Love to give our guests a chance to promote their podcast, books, things like that. I was just on an awesome podcast that you co-host. I listen to it all the time. So please share that and where people can find it. Yeah, it's a simple one. It's called Investing in the US. You can just Google that. It's a podcast that's been going since 2014. Had you, yourself on the show. Thank you so much for coming on. The way you can find it from a just an episode point of view is go to readgoosens.com. That's R E E D. G O O S S E N S dot com, or just search my name and investing in the US, and it's going to come up on on Apple or wherever you podcast. I love it, love it. Thank you for sharing that. I re- really can't wait for that episode to drop. By the way, we had a lot of. We, we, I think we were both higher energy in that episode because we, were, we both weren't <laughs> as tired, but you know, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. So go listen to that episode after you hear this one, and I think you really enjoy that one as well as a supplement to this episode. So, and, and I think you could probably Google my name plus the episode, the name of the show. And probably find that episode very quickly. Great. So yeah, it hasn't it hasn't hit yet, but it will hit. <laughs> it's okay. As of as of now, we're, this one's probably a few weeks out. So hopefully, when this one airs, that one will be on. We'll see. Yep. So last question, Reed. You know, we at Quattro, one of our four pillars of Quattro is philanthropy, and it is one that we hold near and dear to our hearts. So I'd love it if you would share, you know, one or two of your philanthropic ventures. Uh, you know, where you put your money that you're donating back, because a lot of times. People will actually go down on the show notes and donate on your behalf and join your cause. So love to promote it. What do you say? Yeah. So in terms of ph- philanthropic adventures, you know, for the longest period of time, building this company has always been about a bit of a self-indulgent personal, you know, getting to personal financial freedom and all that sort of stuff. As I've started to become into my own self-worth and what I was touching on a little bit earlier before about the mistakes. I've now realized there's, there's bigger things in life that I want to, you know, give back to because, you know, we're making really good money in this business, you know, creating financial freedom for my family. And one of those things, and I haven't got into it yet, is, is you know, what I'm you know, very much into water conservation. I do think you know, I come from a, a desert, an arid country like Australia. You know, we, we, we use water like it should be a little bit more you know, treated like a commodity. So I, I do have, you know, goals and aspirations to, you know, 
in sustainable water use. I don't know what that looks like just yet. In terms of giving back to the community of multifamily, I do, I'm a coach on a few different platforms and you know I've been able to help others get started in the industry, other younger entrepreneurs and, 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 and syndicators you know, get their first deal done because someone helped me when I got my first deal done. So this is a business that has you know, provided so many incredible opportunities for me personally and trying to give that and teach others is, is also a way that I like to give back. So yeah. I love that. Well, Reed, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your experience, your wisdom, a little bit of your crystal ball. I know all of ours are a little foggy right now. You know, I think we see, we all seem to agree some good things are coming. So this too shall pass. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Don't waste a good recession, folks, whether you're an investor or a buyer. So with that being said, Reed, we, the listeners of Real Estate Runway, wish you all the best with your new endeavor as a, as a father with your, your little girl and hope to see you on the show here maybe in the next six months or something. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.